Uh, let's get started. So uh, real quickly about uh, project two. Um, if you haven't signed up yet for a group, please go do that. Uh, the other thing we're going to change is that uh, we felt that the number of s submissions, of people submitting their project one at the very end was higher than I wanted. Uh, and it's sort of partly my fault for not warning you guys ahead of time, hey, don't wait till the last minute. And so to avoid this same issue for project two, what we're going to have is we'll have a checkpoint halfway where you just have to do inserts and reads. So you have to do splits. Uh, and then the, so that that'll be like 25 or 30% of the grade. And then we'll have the, the regular submission deadline. That'll still be the same. And then have to, have, have to support the full, the full test suite. OK? Again, it's just a forcing function for you guys to start looking at this uh, sooner rather than later. So you're not like trying to write a thread safe in memory index one day before it's due. Cause that's going to be a bad idea. OK? All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, scheduling. So last class was about how to uh, take a query request from the client, put it into our system, run it somehow. We didn't say how. We we're getting there. And then we would take a response from the, the result from the query and shove it back over the wire to the client. So now today's class, we're, we're going to start the, the next chapter of how we're actually going to execute those queries. And so we're going to focus on scheduling. So we're still not actually executing the, the, the scans yet and reading our indexes, but we're, 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 getting, we're getting closer, closer to that. So we need, we need to define some terms we're going to use uh, going forward to describe what query execution looks like. So a query plan is going to be comprised of operators. Uh, and you can think of these as sort of like relational algebra operators. Uh, and so we'll talk about how we do query planning uh, in, a, in a few more lectures. The basic idea is that we get this SQL query like this, and we can represent it as a, as a, as a directed tree structure uh, of, of comprised of the operators. And at the lowest level, we have these access methods where they're going to scan tuples or scan an index and feed them up into the next operator. And then the results percolate to the top. So we're going to define now a, an invocation of an operator in our query plan. Uh, a specific invocation of it will be defined as an operator instance. So for a given operator in our query plan, like scan table A, we can have multiple instances of this operator that allow us to execute this scan in, in parallel. And now the idea is the way we're going to group up, uh, group, group together the, the operators' instances that we're going to execute in our system, right, we're going to call the, these groups as, as tasks. Right? And the idea is that, sort of like in the pipeline model, we wanted to have string up together as many tasks as we can uh, within a single task or pipeline so that we, we don't have a context switch going from, you know, from one task to the other. So for a scan on A, I can do the filter, and then depending on what join algorithm I'm doing, like if I'm doing a hash join, then I can have the pipeline also build the hash table for me. So I'm just passing up intermediate results from one operator instance to the next. So again, at a high level, our job today is to figure out how we're going to schedule these tasks, right? And where they're going to execute and what they're actually going to do. So for every single query plan that shows up, we got to decide now where, when, and how to execute it. And so this gives, one of these decisions is, well, how many tasks should we actually use uh, for our query plan? Like if we, we say we have this number of cores, when we have, uh, we could assign one task uh, for our query plan for each core, or we may want to oversubscribe, have more tasks than we have cores, and that way we can have more flexible scheduling. Then this question of how many cores we actually want to use. Right? So we can have a X number of tasks and Y number of threads, and, or cores, and we can decide how many cores we want to use. Then the, we have to make, decide on uh, what core should a task actually execute on. And then when that task completes and it produces some output, we need to decide where that output's going to go. Right? We've been vague about this so far. We're saying, oh, we execute this query, we get back a result. But now as we start executing the tasks to, that are comprised in that query, we have to make the decision of where we should take its output. And, and as we see, as we talk about different sort of memory architectures, we need to be aware of where that memory is actually located, where we're reading and writing to, so that we get the best performance. Right? So the reason why we're going to do all of this is that the database system is, is, knows exactly what the query is, knows exactly what the tasks are, it knows what, it, what threads it has available to it, it knows where the memory or the, or the data is actually located. 
So we're in the position to make the best decision about how to execute this query plan efficiently. The OS doesn't know this. Question. How, does it define, how do we like define pipelines as like series of threads? Like how long would a pipeline? So this question is how do we define what a pipeline is? We'll come to that next class. But the basic way to think about this is how far can I take a single tuple or a batch of tuples and write it up the query plan before I have to before I, I get to a point where I can't go farther. So in this case here, scan A, filter, and do, say you're doing a hash join. I can build the hash table on this side of the join, but I can't actually produce any result to do the projection because I, I need to do the probe side. So this is called a pipeline breaker. Yes? Is it like actually a pipeline breaker? Because if you have both sides of the pipeline feeding into it, you can start generating some certain like matches and you can start giving stuff up to the higher level. So his state question is, is, it, is this truly a pipeline breaker because if I had, uh, if the pipeline breaker was here and I materialized the output uh, f from both of these guys, then shove it into my hash table, right? Like the basic thing, I can't go higher in the tree until I have all the data from one side, right? So there's a pipeline here for this side, but the pipeline for B can go all the way up. But this will make more sense next class. But the main idea of what I care about is, like, you understand, is like, oh, well, a task is what we're going to schedule, and a task can be comprised of multiple operators. And we're roughly going to base it on pipelines. And again, the, the, the main takeaway, again, from all of this is that we're not going to rely on the OS to do any of this for us. We're, we're, the data system is always going to know better, so it's going, to, it's going to make the best decision. So to begin, I want to first talk about different process models we can have in our database system architecture. It basically tells us, you know, what is it? It's going to find what a worker actually is. Is it a thread? Is it a process? Then we'll talk about the problem of data placement. And for in-memory databases, we need to be aware of the layout of memory and the physical location of addresses in memory, so that we can have our threads try to our workers try to act, try to operate on local data. And then we'll talk about uh, the different techniques for doing dynamic scheduling in in a database system. Okay. So the 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 paper had you guys read on Hyper. You know, that's an example of doing you know, dynamic scheduling. And we'll contrast this with something like HANA, which is going to be doing, uh, you know, having different types of worker pools, or different kind of stealing versus no stealing policies. Right? So that's sort of what our focus is on today, but, or for this part here. But to make this decision about how we're going to design our database system to do scheduling here, we need to be aware of, what we're, of what, how we built the system up here. Okay? All right, so let's first talk about how we're going to assign uh, workers to computational units in our database system. So the, the, the process model is going to find whether the system, how the system is going to support uh, concurrent requests from a multi-user application, meaning our application could send multiple queries at the same time, right, multiple transaction invocations at the same time, and we need a way to decide how we're going to interleave them uh, at the sort of low-level hardware level. Right? So we're not talking about how we decide at a, a logical level, like what what transactions allowed to read what pieces of data. This is like, how do we take a task and actually uh, assign it to some worker, and what is that worker? So I'm using the term worker. I'm occasionally going to slip up and say thread, but and, and for, for the systems we're talking about, it is going to be a thread. But the way to think about this is like, it doesn't, the data system doesn't know, te technically doesn't need to know whether it's a, and it does need to know, take the back. It's, it's a sort of a high-level term to describe, again, a, a component in the system that can execute tasks. And this could be either a process or, or a thread. And the reason why I'm saying, I, I took back what I said, where the, the data system doesn't need to know, but certainly if it's a process, I need to know how to communicate with, with other processes because they're not going to technically be in my same address space. So it's just basically a way for us to execute tasks and then return results to the application. So there's a great book. Uh, written uh, over a decade ago from uh, Mike Stonebreaker, uh, Joe Hellerstein at Berkeley, and the guy that runs most of AWS, James Hamilton, right, called Architecture of a Database System. So this is in the context of a, of a discordian system, but this book really lays out at a nice sort of clean abstraction you know, how you actually design the system at, the, at sort of this low level execution level here. All right, so the three approaches we're going to talk about are process per database worker, uh, process pool, and a thread per database worker. And again, we've covered this in the introduction class, but I just want to go over this again. And the spoiler would be that 
for all the systems we're going to talk about uh, today and going forward the rest of the semester, it's going to be the last one here because this one is, is the most common one in, in modern systems. So a process per worker is where every single worker in our system is going to be a separate OS process. And so that means that when a request shows up, say it goes through some kind of dispatcher, uh, it can then hand off the connection to another worker that, that will then read the socket and allow and take any request that it gets from the, from the, from the client and execute it on the database system. And so the, all the scheduling that's being done here is, is managed by the operating system. Because we're just calling fork to, to start off a new process, and we have no direct control to say whether, you know, it should, when, it, when it, should, it should run. So the tricky thing sometimes often is that with this is like, I may not know in my dispatcher exactly, uh, you know, how much work these workers are doing, and I have to rely on the OS to do sort of throttling and, and, and flow control because these guys can just do whatever they want. Or I need to write extra, extra code and have them communicate some way back to the dispatcher to have a centralized view about what's happening. But in systems like Postgres, uh, as far as I know, they don't do this. Other systems that do the approach is DB2 and Oracle. DB2 is a weird one because there is a, you know, there's, when people say, oh, I'm running DB2, there's actually four versions of DB2 that are completely separate code bases. Uh, like one's for ZOS, one's for some other mainframe system, and then there's like the Linux, Unix, Windows one. And there's a fourth one I forget, right? And they're all completely separate. So we'll see in the next two slides, DB2 is going to support all these approaches because they have to run in all these different environments, but it may not be the exact same code base every single time. Okay? One advantage you get from this is that if the worker, if there's a mistake in the software and the worker crashes, you don't take down the whole system. This worker just dies, and then you can fork a new one and, and bring it back up. So this makes the system slightly more resilient than you would have in a, in a, in a threading-based model, because if one thread has a seg fault, then the whole process dies. The next approach is just an extension of the worker, uh, a single process per worker. We have a process pool. And rather than forking off the dispatcher forking off a new process for every single request that shows up, it knows it has a bunch of workers that, that are available to it that can hand off the request and have that you know, run the query for us. And in some cases, too, if I, if I want to support uh, intro query parallelism, I can take a single query and run across multiple uh, processes, multiple workers. This uh, one worker could, could identify that there's other workers available to it in the same pool that are idle and start handing off work, work to that. Right? The bad, bad thing about this approach is that it's going to ruin our locality unless we have extra uh, logic in the dispatcher to be mindful of what worker executed our query the last time. Right? Because say these guys are all running on separate sockets, uh, and if for this one request, the first query shows up, I run on this worker, the, the next query shows up for the same connection, but it runs now on another worker running on another socket, all the cache locality I had by bringing in data into memory or the, the local cache for this worker is now gone because now I'm not running on a completely different socket. So this oftentimes can be bad for in-memory systems just because the overhead of, of keeping track of what worker I, 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 I ran on last, and either pausing until that worker's freed up if it's running another query before it can execute my next query, or uh, you know, basically holding it until the next query shows up, which is just the same thing as the previous slide. All that uh, sort of orchestration can slow things down. And Postgres added this in 2015, right? They can have uh, inter-query parallelism, and as I said, DB2 tries to support everything. What's the most common one is the thread per worker. Right, a multi-threaded application question. In the previous one, like uh, even if they are running on the so uh, on socket on different machines, then it is fine. But like if they're running no, no, on the same the, machine, then assume assume you're running on on like for just assume for this semester, it's all single machine. Okay, then if they are on the same machine, then like uh, you're saying they are on different ports. Sockets. Okay. A few more slides. It'll make more sense. If they're on the same socket, you have local cache. And um, L1, L2 is not shared, but L3 is shared. So if you run on the same socket, the penalty of a cache miss, sorry, the penalty of the cache miss is always the same, but like the likelihood that the data I need, that, like if I have a query that executes and reads some data, the next query shows up wants to read that same data, right? You see this all the time, read after write, or read modify write. Um, then if I'm running on the same socket, then the data I just read could be hanging out in L3 cache, and that'll go fast. 
if I'm on another socket which doesn't have share the L3 cache, I pay another cache miss. And then why is the same thing not uh, true for the previous one? So the previous one is, is like, for this connection, right, this worker is now dedicated to the connection to this client. So any query that shows up is always going to go to this worker, right, because it basically takes over listening. Like, basically what happens is the, so the way Postgres works is this is called the Postmaster. The, the connection shows up. The Postmaster says, great, I can hand you off to a worker. Go now right to this socket or this port number here. And so this comes back now, and this thing's listening on this port, and now has direct access to write, write send queries here. So the queries will always on the Yes, dispatcher. you're bypassing the dispatcher. This one is like, I'm always going to this dispatcher. Think of this as a centralized scheduler, and it's now making a decision on how to hand, handle things off to different processes. Thread per worker is, is, is it's a single process, and we have inside that process we have multiple threads. You may or may not have a dispatcher thread. You still can do the same approach where you have one thread listens on a socket that all incoming requests have to go to, and then you hand it off to an, another socket uh, on another thread so it can process things. Or you can just have a, um, and you have a dedicated thread per your connection, or you can just have a, a sort of a general purpose networking layer that just hands off work to anybody uh, that, that has, has idle cycles. Um, as I said, every single database system written in the last 10 years uh, it follows this approach. So you may be thinking, well, this is clearly better. You, know, that you don't pay a penalty for context switches. Everything's in the same address space, so any thread can read any, any you know, memory location of another thread. Yes, you have to do the, the current signature stuff to make sure you don't have any issues or, or the, the latching to make sure that you don't clobber each other when you access uh, critical sections. So, but this is clearly going to have, be a lower overhead than the process, process approach. I'm going to take a guess why nobody built databases this way in the 1980s, 1990s. Like Correctly. So POSIX threads or P threads were not standardized. So all these different operating systems, you know, Sun or Solaris, uh, HPOX, uh, before Linux even came around, but Linux came around in the early 90s, so there wasn't a POSIX standard to say, here's a threading API. Everyone had their own API. And they had the semantics of how they, you know, could spawn threads and and uh, you know, do joins on them was slightly different. Well, you know, it wasn't dramatically different, but like the, the API was certainly different. So if I want to support a bunch of different operating systems for my database system, then I would have to have a sort of wrapper layer to make sure that, that, um, that I had sort of a, the lowest common denominator of what the thread API was, so it made it more portable. Now with pthreads, this is, this is not an issue. So one thing I'll also say too, well, one of the things we did when we sort of first started building Peloton was we took the Postgres source code, forked it like everyone else does. Um, we then converted it to be multi-threaded. If you go Google uh, Postgres multi-threaded, you'll see a mailing list post from a former PhD student saying, hey, look, we did this. Uh, I forget why we did it. It was a bad, whatever. Uh, but it turns out the way we actually got it to convert, convert it was it wasn't like we took the um, in the Postgres source code, it's a single code base, but they have all these pound of fines that says, if, you know, if Linux, do this. If Win32, do that. If you go take the Windows code, you can actually convert that to pthreads much more easily than you could convert the, uh, the Linux code. Um, anyway, we also converted the C++11, which, again, for, for historical reasons, I don't remember. But in our new system, we threw all that away. We don't, have any, we don't inherit any Postgres code anymore. So again, the multi-threaded approach is better. You have lower overhead context switch, uh, and then you don't have to manage shared memory. In the, in the multi-process case, you're either sending uh, IPCs to each other, or you have shared memory to, to, so that everyone can read and write into the same location. The important thing also to point out, too, is just because we may be using a multi-threaded uh, process model doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get intra-query parallelism in our database system. So MySQL is a multi-threaded database system, but it's one thread per query request. Right, they can't divide it up the tasks across multiple workers. Right, and in their environment doing OTP, that's, that's, that's fine. And as I said, I'm not aware of anybody, any other system in the last, built in the last 10 years. And unless they're, they're forked from, from Postgres, which is a you know, process pool model approach, unless they're based on Postgres, every new system is going to be using multi-threads. Uh, multi okay? And that's what, that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to use in our system. All right, so now let's get to what his question was about this, this issue of, of, of whether it's the core running the same core in the same socket or a different socket. So regardless of how we're going to do our, uh, our worker allocation or task assignment policy in our system, we want to make sure that all the workers are going to operate on local data. 
So in a distributed system, this is like a no-brainer. If I have two machines and my data is, you know, one machine is on the West Coast, one machine is on the East Coast, my query shows up and wants to touch data on the West Coast, I send the query to the West Coast and process it there. So that way it's operating on local data. Well, a multi-socket, multi-core data, or a multi-socket, multi-core system, even though it's running on, on, you know, one box, still is sort of like a distributed database system. So the same rules, the same, same concepts apply here. So we want to make sure that we always have our tasks operate on local data for where the thread of the worker is actually running. So this means now that our scheduler needs to be aware of what the memory layout is for our underlying hardware. And at a high level, there's two approaches. There's the uniform and, and then the non-uniform memory access. So this is also, uh, the acronym is, is NUMA. So you'll hear me say multiple times, NUMA region, NUMA this, NUMA that. That's, that's this one. This is the most common one we have in, in a multi-socket system today. Back in the day, we had what was called uniform memory access. This is sometimes called symmetric multiprocessors, SMP. Right, it's basically the same thing. And the idea is that the, the tasks, or the workers are running down here in the cores. They do have some local CPU caches, L1, L2, L3. But all memory is managed through this system bus. So for any task running on any socket, the cost of accessing a chunk of memory is the same no matter where I'm running on. Right? So if I'm, if I'm down here and I want to access memory that's in, in this, this dim here, the cost of retrieving that is the same if I was running here or the other ones. Because right? there's, there's overhead of, of going over there, this system bus. So we still need to do cache and validation in this world. Right? The, 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 the hardware is aware of, I read this region of memory and now it's in my CPU cache. Somebody else reads the same thing and writes to it. The system bus has to take can, handle of invalidating our, our cache over, you know, our cache entry over here. All of that sort of handled for you. So as I said, this is how they built uh, up until maybe like 2005-ish, 2006. This is how Intel and AMD were designing their uh, multi-socket uh, CPU systems. Uh, but now we have we have the NUMA stuff, right? And in this world, there's not really any from a database system perspective. There's no um, intelligence, intelligence we need to embed in our scheduler, because as I said, it does, we don't know, we don't care. This looks like one giant address space, and the access cost is the same. What modern systems look like is in the, in the NUMA model is that you, still, you now have memory that's local to each socket. So you, can, you always have your, your local CPU cache, and then you're going to have DIMMs that are, that are going to be physically closer to your socket and have a direct path to go read and write to it. So on, um, on Intel chips, the CPU cache for every core, the L1, L2 will be uh, specific to that core, but then they also share, share L3, and then obviously they share the, the DIM here. And then now if I need to have my, my task running here, if it needs to access memory that's not in my local DIM, and I gotta go over to this other CPU here, I'm gonna go over this interconnect to send my message in the hardware to say, hey, go read this thing for me. Then the, the CPU knows how to go out to the DIM and then bring it back down into me. So the, the performance difference here for just pure like read-write speed is about 50% slower. So if I have to read data around here, roughly it's gonna be 50% slower than if I was reading data locally. Yes? Is it faster for the CPU locally? Because like, is there still a system bus? Like for the here to here? Mm -hmm. No, the, the bus is basically like, this bus is basically saying, like, all right, I want to access memory address, and you basically translate that into some dim slot, right? So that means locally it is faster? Yeah, lo locally is, yeah. So if I have to read here, it's 50% slower than reading locally here. Like, think of this as, like, as the fast path. Okay. Yeah. Um, so again, like, that means now in our database system, when we start loading in our data, we want to be aware w where we're actually going to put it. Then when queries show up and they want to start executing, we need to be aware of what data they want to touch right, in our task and make sure our tasks run here. The OS doesn't know anything. Right? The OS sees a bunch of threads uh, that want to do some kind of work, but it doesn't, it doesn't, know, you know, doesn't know your Bitcoin mining thread from your database system thread. So we have to tell it, hey, we want to make sure that we run things locally here. All right? So the, this interconnect, um, it's, it's, you know, it's a high, high speed, high speed uh, not really, a, I don't think, it's a, I wouldn't call it a bus, but basically it's a high speed connection between these different sockets. That's multiplex, you can go both directions and talk to anybody. Um, Intel originally called this the quick path interconnect, the QPI, then that wasn't good enough, so now they call it the ultra path interconnect, 
uh, in 2017. AMD has their own version. It's now called the Infinity Fabric. Power has their own thing. AM, uh, ARM, I think, has their own thing as well. But it's, I, I, at a high level, they're all, it's all doing the same thing, right? Okay, so now, if I call malloc, the question is, where is my memory going to show up, all right? So the way to think about this is that we're going to take the, the tables that we have in memory, and we're going to partition them or break them up into, into chunks of data or blocks. And then now we want to assign them, each of these blocks, to a specific CPU core, right? And, or, or more high level CPU socket or a NUMA region. So if we're aware of where we're putting our data, where that data is being located, when a query shows up and we make decisions about how to break it up into tasks and what those tasks, what pieces of data those tasks are going to operate on, we can make sure that we schedule our operators to execute on, on data that's local to this. So this is an old problem in distributed databases called data placement. So think of partitioning as deciding like how do I break it up and what boundaries, and then data placement is saying where do I put those actual partitions that I've generated. So in Linux, you can control this through the, the move pages syscall or the NUMA control command line option or command line tool. So basically what happens with, new, with, with move pages is that if you just invoke it with a memory address, it'll come back and tell you what NUMA region it's on. But if you invoke it with a memory address, a size, and a NUMA region, it'll, it'll move that data to, to that location. And I think that's a, that's a blocking syscall. So if you think about this, if I have a one terabyte database, I can load it into memory and it'll sort of get randomly scattered across different, different sockets, then I can go back and call move pages and start putting things in, in you know, where I want them. All right? So let's talk about now what happens when you call malloc. So let's say our data system calls malloc because we're going to load into one terabyte database. The question I have for you guys is, what happens? What happens in that syscall? Assume that my, my allocator has, has already handed out all the, the, the pages that it has, that's already pre-allocated. What does it actually do? Yes? Calls S-break? He says calls S-break. Yes, sort of. No, well, yeah, that's this, right? So S-break will, will extend the process data segment, but that's just getting, moving it to be larger. But after that, it's actually not doing anything. It's like all it did was update the internal bookkeeping data structures it has for, for this boundary, but all the virtual memory just allocated with, with the S-break is not actually physically allocated in memory because no one's accessed it yet. Right? It's only when we touch the data does, is there a page fault, and then the OS says, oh, it looks like you're actually going to use this memory. Let me go have it be backed by physical memory. Right? So now, though, let's say after the page falls, after you call S-break, and then someone tries to access this memory, where are we actually going to put this, this memory we, that we just allocated? Let me take a guess. Is it the thread that allocated it, or is it the thread that touched it? Touched it. Touched it. Why? Uh, that's what the paper said. That's what the paper said. Yes. OK, good. Fantastic. OK. Yes. So there is a policy that to, to tell the OS that Whatever thread touches that memory, that's where I want it to be allocated. So when there's, so I can allocate it. It, it calls sbreak, extends virtual memory for my for my process. But only when the thread touches it, then there's the page fault, and then we put it uh, in a physical location. Yes. So the OS cannot promise virtual memory unless it does have enough physical memory. His question is, uh, the OS cannot promise virtual memory unless it has physical memory. What do you mean by promise? Like you say that you want like uh, five. Think big. I, 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 want, I want one terabyte of memory. Right, right. What happens? Um, if I do have one terabyte, I can promise it, promise it to you, but I don't have it immediately. If I don't have it, I can't just give it to you, and later you can. Oh, you can. You can. You can, yes. And then when I actually try to do something on it, I get a fault. Later. Yes. Isn't that bad? Shouldn't you it, get a fault? It's bad, but is it wrong? Arguably. You have swap space for that. You have swap space, yes. So that's the way, so actually, you can see this now. If you run some of the tests with ASAN for, for our database system, it'll say the virtual memory size of the database process is 12 terabytes. We obviously don't have 12 terabytes on, on any, any machine, right? So the, the OS is making a decision here that like, most people are gonna allocate more memory than they actually need, so I'll just let you have it. And if you actually end up needing it, then you, yes, you, you have to start swapping out pages to, to the swap space on disk,
And that makes it look, that's virtual memory, it makes it look like you have more memory than you actually have. Right? But in our, in our database world, for, for, like, for the things we're talking about here, we're actually talking about the, 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 the data the inside tables, the tuples themselves. We're going to use that space. So think of this as like, all right, well, I, I'm not going to allocate, I'm not going to turn to database as one and have it pre-allocate you know, one gigabyte of memory. It's only as I start inserting data that I, re I recognize, oh, well, I'm running out of space for my pre-allocated memory that I have now. Let me go grab another you know, 100 megabytes break it up onto blocks, start filling data in. So the question is, uh, we're trying to get here is like, when I do that, where is that end memory actually going to be stored? By default, you get this, where the OS does round robin to start to, to writing out pages to you know, one socket at a time and goes around over and over again. What he said, as, as he pointed out in the paper, is that you can tell the OS, I want to use the first touch policy, so that I'll allocate the memory, and then when the task actually starts inserting into that, uh, into that, that block, uh, there'll be the page fault, and then that's when it updates the, the virtual memory table to now be back by physical memory, and then I can insert that data uh, into to the, to, to the table, and that physical memory will be wherever my thread is actually running. Right? So again, you can do this, you can modify the location after the fact. You can call that move pages syscall uh, to say, all right, well, I've loaded my table, and let me go start moving things around accordingly, but that's actually obviously stupid because, like, if I'm loading a one terabyte data, I don't want to load it all in first and just have it be scattered around randomly, then go back and do a sequential scan and, and then actually start you know, moving things to the right location. I want to use this policy ahead of time, be aware where I'm scheduling my, um, scheduling my, 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 my task so that I have an even distribution of, of the data across all, all threads, or across all sockets, right? So let's see the impact of, of this uh, when we have fine-grained control of where we're putting data. So I'm going to show two slides here. The first will be OLTP and the first will be OLAP. So this is from a paper a few years ago uh, from Natasha Alamaki's group at an EPFL. And so this is running an in-memory database on a four-socket machine, with eight cores per, per, or six cores per socket. And they're just going to run the TPCC payment transaction. And what they're going to do is they're going to put the, uh, the different warehouses or the, the blocks of data for the, for the, for the database at, on different configurations across the, the sockets. So spread will be every, every socket has, uh, has you know, an equal portion of one quarter of the total table. Group is where you're going to shove everything into a single socket. Mix is where you split it 50-50. And the OS is just letting the OS do whatever it wants. And I'm putting question marks here, here because like, we don't know. So whatever the policy that the OS decides to do is what it gets. And so what you can see here, obviously, that if our if our threads can access data that are all running on the same socket, you'll get about a 30% improvement over what the OS would do. Because right? the OS is going to do something, looks like it's doing something a little bit smarter than spread, but not that you know, much smarter than mix or, or group. So we, this is just showing that if you let the, let the OS be in charge of deciding where it's going to place data, and also where it's going to schedule our threads, uh, is, you're going to have a bad time and you get 30% better by, by doing it yourself. Right? And then when I think about this too, it's like all the threads are running on this one socket. So you may be thinking, all right, well, wouldn't it be better for me to, to spread across multiple sockets so that our threads have you know, uh, a larger portion of the CPU caches to themselves? Well, no, because going over that interconnect to transfer data from one thread to the next uh, is, is going to be problematic. Because this payment transaction will update data at different partitions. So you may have to go cross socket. The next slide I want to show you is a, a microbenchmark experiment that some former students of mine ran a few years ago. Um, so this is running a sort of a, a simple execution engine that they wrote for, I think for, they were taking 618. And all it's going to do is, is just a sequential scan over 10 million tuples. And they're going to run this on a beast machine we had in the PTL or PDL. Uh, there was eight sockets. Uh, was, at the time, it was, it's like a 2008 machine. It's a bit old, but like it was the only eight socket machine we had, we had access to. And every, every socket has 10 cores plus hyperthreading. And so the, what, along the x-axis, you're going to see is that we're going to add more threads to do the sequential scan in parallel. So the, the size of the table is always going to be the same. And now we're just adding more threads so that we can you know, do, do, uh, do execute the scan in parallel. So what you see is that uh, at the lower core counts, or thread counts, the performance difference between the, 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 sorry, the random partition is like you just let the OS decide where it wants to put it. The local partition is where you, you assign threads to execute the scan on data that's local to its, uh, its NUMA region. So at the lower thread counts, 
because the, the table is spread across multiple sockets, uh, the probability that a thread is going to have to access data at a remote socket and go over the interconnect is higher. So, uh, so therefore, it doesn't really matter if you're dividing up uh, intelligently or not. But as we now increase the number of threads, then the amount of cross-socket traffic we have for, for our scan threads uh, goes down significantly for, for when we do the local, partition, local partitioning. And that's why you get better performance. And then this division point here is when hyperthreading kicks in. So up into 80 cores, it's all you know, real hardware cores. But then, then the hyperthreading, you get the, the, the virtual cores. And at that point here, we're, we're, we're bound by memory bandwidth. So throwing more cores and more threads at us th doesn't help us anything. Because it's not like you know, one thread stalling, waiting for like, disk I.O., another thread can run. Everybody's just waiting for get stuff out of, out of the memory controller. So that's why the performance plateaus. So in this case here, uh, I forget the exact numbers, but it's almost about a 2x performance difference between, or over 2x performance difference between being intelligent at how we do our, you know, place our data and run, and run our operators versus uh, you know, letting the OS and the hardware manage it for us. Okay? So as I said uh, briefly, the, there's this notion of partitioning and data placement. We're not going to talk about partitioning here. Um, but think about partitioning scheme is, again, it's some policy we're going to use to, de to decide how we divide our data up into chunks. And the placement, decides, the placement policy decides where we're going to put those partitions. So the placement policy is sort of agnostic to what's actually in our partitions. And you saw this in the Morsel paper, right? In the Morsel paper, they said all the threads care about is that they're operating on data that's local to it. And they just pull it out of queue and, and, just, and process it. In a partitioning scheme, you can have some higher level logical uh, uh, meaning or semantics to how you're dividing up the data that you can then exploit in your, for, for query execution. And this is why we'll cover this uh, in future lectures. Like, if I know that my, uh, my, query, my workload is always going to be doing uh, hash joins on a given partition, or sorry, on a given attribute, then I could decide to hash partition my data on that join attribute so that now when I run the join algorithm, all the data that, that, that every operator needs to operate you know, to do the join is, is local to it. And the query optimizer is aware of this partitioning scheme. All that is, is sort of above us when we do data placement and scheduling here. OK? All right, so at this point, what do we have? We have a process model. We have a task assignment model. Basically, how we're going to decide uh, you know, where, should, where should tasks actually run. It's where the memory is, is local to it. And we decided how we're going to decide, you know, determine what, what mechanism we're going to use to pin uh, chunks of memory to, or chunks of data to, to memory locations. So now we need to talk about how we're actually going to create a bunch of tasks that we want to then execute for our, for our logical query plan. And then once we have those, we need to decide how we're actually going to, going to, to, to schedule them. So for O to be queries, this is super simple. Because most of the time, there's not really any opportunities for parallelism in a single old to be query. I could have multiple old to be queries running at the same time across different transactions. And certainly, I want to have them run on separate threads. And they want to run on, on, you know, on, on the, the sockets that have the, the, the memory that's local to it or the, for the data they want to access. But within a single old to be query, I can't really divide that up into to sub chunks, right? Like, go get Andy's uh, account record. That's like a single index probe to go get my one record. I can't parallelize that. So this is going to be this, what we care about this for is for the OLAP queries. And then we can still apply now the same techniques we're going to do to schedule OLAP queries to schedule multiple OTP queries at the same time right, that are running on behalf of different transactions. So the easiest way to do scheduling is called static scheduling. And that's where the data system decides before it even starts executing the query, I know the number of threads that I have, I know the number of cores that I have. Uh, it can decide, like, I'll just say I have one task for every core and then shove them off to the, the hardware and let them execute, right? So this is the easiest thing to do because I don't worry about monitoring the behavior of the task while they're running. I just say, this is my plan. I'm sticking with it. And I don't care about alternatives. So this is the, this is the, if, if you're building a data system for the first time, this is probably what you end up building because it's the easiest thing to do. So again, this is not the same thing as, as, as the placement policy stuff, right? We, we have a placement policy to, to have, uh, that we use to assign the task to threads based on the data location. This is just sort of saying, how do we divide up our tasks? And, and at, at runtime, how do we actually schedule them? So the 
approach that I had you guys, the reason why this is going to be problematic for OLAP queries especially, is that it doesn't take into account the, the, you know, the, the runtime of these individual tasks on these different cores. So if I have that one terabyte database, and I have a, say I'm, I'm doing a scan on it with a predicate, and for whatever reason on one socket, the data at that socket, that, that predicate evaluates to true for more tuples. Where every other socket, the, the predicate is very selective, so I end up throwing most of the data away. And so that means now for my task runs on my one socket, it's going to spend much longer uh, than the other sockets to finish that one task because more tuples are, are, are getting put into its output buffer. As in, it's doing more memory copying. And if a static scheduling approach, I can't dynamically adjust the system and say, all right, well, I see this guy is going slow, and there's much more data that, I, that, it, that it could possibly execute uh, that, that we're waiting on. Let me go bring in other threads to help it out, to, to speed things up. So a static scheduling can't do that, but this is what dynamic scheduling uh, can, can handle. And this is the problem that the hyper guys are trying to solve with their approach. So the morsel-driven scheduling is the idea is that we're going to process our tasks in parallel over these horizontal partitions that they call morsels. So morsel is a hyper term. It's not like a standard term in, in database systems. I think they picked it because they didn't want to use the word term block because that's used in a bunch of places. They didn't want to use the term partition because that's already a bunch of use, used in a bunch of places. Like a, like a morsel is larger than a block but smaller than a partition. It's a way to think about it. As far as I know, no other system actually uses this term. This, this is specific to Hyper. So they're going to have one worker per core. Uh, and so, so if you have a multi-core socket, you can have multiple cores per, per, for that socket. They're going to do a pool-based task assignment, meaning the, the, the workers are going to run. They're going to check some centralized data structure and say, what work is available, available to me? And then when they load the data in, they'll just do round-robin data placement. <coughs> so they'll have, you know, say, I'm doing a, a bulk insert. And I'll say, well, some portion of that bulk insert goes to this socket, some portion goes to this other socket, or, or, or the morsels. So what's going to be interesting about their approach is that the implementation of the actual database system is going to be entirely NUMA aware, meaning they'll have implementations of operators that recognize whether they're accessing data on a local NUMA region or a remote NUMA region, and they'll, do, they'll have different strategies of where they put the, put the output data or what, what algorithm they actually may want to use. Right? And they'll use this when they make decisions about how to pull things out, out of the task, the task queue. So as I said, they're using a pool model. So that means that there's no separate dispatcher thread. There's no single thread in charge of having a global view of what's going on in the entire system. And the threads are doing, the workers are doing cooperative scheduling because everyone's looking at the same queue. So what's going to happen is that when they pull tasks out of this queue, each worker thread is going to, going to prefer threat of tasks that are going to operate data local to it. But it also can recognize that there are, if there are no tasks available to it that's, that's operating on this local data, it can go can, can try to steal work or steal tasks from another worker thread that may be operating data that, that's, that's remote to, to my worker thread, but because this other worker thread is, is, is going slow for some reason, We'll pick up the slack and, and take some of their work. And in their approach, also too, I'm not actually I don't have a slide for this, but in their model, they only execute one query at a time. So a query shows up, and they're gonna break it up into a bunch of tasks, and you don't move on to the next query until all the tasks for that for that one query are finished. All right, so it's either the query is completely done and there's no more tasks available to it, and I move on to the next one, or a worker thread can go steal tasks that the straggler worker uh, can't keep up with. Question. Yeah, so the so question is, like... What are they using to do that? It's not like a thread. Yeah, so his question is, what is actually dividing up a query into tasks and putting them into the queue? I would call that a dispatcher. That's like a, that's sort of like the, the front-end layer. The query shows up, you, you parse it, you know, parse the SQL, run it through the query optimizer, and then at that point, you, have a, you divide them into tasks and then insert into the queue. And whether that's a dedicated thread that's, that's separate from the networking thread or the networking thread itself, it doesn't, it doesn't matter at this point. I actually don't know what they do. In our current system, we, the same thread that, that takes the, 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 the SQL query off the network socket, parses it, and binds it, and optimizes it, well, then it divides it up. But you could hand it off to another queue. Yes? Uh, how does work work? This question is how does work stealing work? Give me two slides, we'll get there. All right, so first thing we gotta do is divide our data up into, into morsels. So say this is our data table, we have four columns. So morsels are, are just horizontal partitioning. 
where we're going to say, you know, with, within some stride, I, this, is, this is the boundary of a morsel. Um, in, the, in the paper, they talk about they, they use 100,000 tuples per morsel, and they say they pick the, this number because it provides the right amount of parallelism versus the overhead of, of putting stuff in a queue. So for every task I get and pull out of the queue, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to at least operate on, at most, 100,000 tuples. In Peloton, our, our block sizes were 1,000 tuples. In HDOR, the system I helped build before I came to CMU, we did 10 megabytes. As far as I remember from the discussions of those systems, we just picked those numbers out of our ass. Like, it's not like there was any magic to it. I think in the case of, of Hyper, they said they actually did some, you know, some internal micro-benchmarking to determine that 100,000 actually, was actually reasonable. In our new system, as I said a few, more, few uh, lectures ago, our uh, block sizes are one megabytes because this allows us to have the 20-bit offsets. Um, and we use the line as command in C++11 I did to align our blocks to one megabyte chunks in memory. All right, and again, so for each of these morsels, we'll just, we'll just assign them to different CPU sockets. So now, getting to his question, how, how we're actually going, going to do work stealing. So say now we take our query plan, and then we're going to chop it up into different tasks that we're going to put in this global queue. And then now down here for every single socket, it's going to have its local memory, and then it'll have a buffer that, that can store results, but it'll also have all the morsels that it's aware of that are local to it. All right, so the, the buffers will be, as we process a task, we want to write data to our local buffer. It's sort of the same way we talked about doing the delta store in, in the hyper approach, where uh, as I was generating new versions, I put the old versions in thread local memory. And that means that I didn't have to have a coordination of a global uh, sh uh, shared memory space that, that multiple threads could be reading, writing to at the same time. I know that no other thread could be writing to my buffer at this time, so I don't take a latch on it. So now all the threads are going to go uh, look in the queue and pull down the first bunch of tasks uh, that it wants to execute. So in this task queue, you maintain information about the dependency between these, um, between the, uh, between the tasks. So it would know that I can't actually execute the probe until I do the build the hash table and do partitioning for uh, on, on the other side here. So it knows that these are the tasks I can execute first. So again, so as the, each each thread runs a worker runs the task, it's pulling data out of its local memory, which is going to be fast. And then as it you know, actually executes the, the operators and produces some output result, it writes that now to its local buffer. Yes? Is the global task queue in some particular socket or is it distributed? This so question is, is the global task queue in some specific socket or is it distributed? I think they let the OS manage this one because there's not really anything. Everybody, if everyone has to read and write to it, there's not any magic you can do. And think about it too. Like the... You can first read the tasks that are present in your local memory and see if they are, and then they Yeah, so his point is like, well, well, we'll see this in HANA. Right, so his statement is, this global task queue is a shared, shared memory space, right? So, I need to, so they're going to use a lock-free or lat-free hash table to avoid having to synchronize on, on this or have a heavy synchronization, synchronization primitive. But you could partition the memory of this global task queue such that these guys look in their local memory first, find tasks that are specific to him, and if not, go look at other ones. Hana would do this. As far as I know, Hyper doesn't. One other thing is that like, uh, you only push the tasks that are uh, local to them in their task queues, and they, when they know they are going to some other task queue, they know that it is not local. So in anything in your local task queue, the task will always be local towards you. Correct. Hana does this. We'll see it in a few more slides. Yes. Theirs is just global. Um, I think what other, I mean... You can just read it and you know it's yours only then just yeah, yeah. start doing it. Yes, for whatever reason they didn't do this. So, but the, 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 point, the point I'm trying to make is like, the morsel size is 100,000 100, tuples. Yeah. That's where the big, over, the bottleneck is going to be if I'm going over the interconnect to a remote socket. Like the bottleneck is reading this. Going and fetching one task, that's going to be maybe a kilobyte of a size. It's not going to be that big. So going, getting, fetching one thing from a remote memory region, it's not a big deal. That's not where the bottleneck is. So you want, again, you want to opt, it's Omno's law. We want to optimize where the, the big overhead is or we're spending all our time. It's with this, and that's what they optimize. All right, so say now these first two threads, uh, make sure this is still on, good. The first two threads are, are finish up, the or first two workers finish up their tasks. But the third guy is running slower. As I said, so maybe this filter is 
is unselective, so we're generating a lot of output and running into our buffers, and that means we're doing copying and we're, we're running slower. So now the other two, other two workers can go grab the next two tasks and sort of execute. Same thing, but say now this first one, though, finishes up this task more quickly. It can then recognize that, oh, well, the um, B3 is waiting, is, is also needs to be executed before we can execute the, the next task in our, in our pipeline or in our query plan. So let me go ahead and steal this guy, bring it down, and, and, and operate on it. So that means now I'm going to have to copy data or move data. Uh, you're not moving data. You're copying data from the memory of the morsels for, in this socket here. You're putting it into your CPU cache over here. So that's going over the interconnect. But as I produce output, then I'm going to write this in my local buffer. And there's some metadata they're maintaining to say, for this task, the location of the, 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 the intermediate result that the next operator would need in, in our task queue is located here. So there's some internal bookkeeping that they're, they're, they're keeping track of to know this task output got written to this location. Yes? The paper said something like the same pipeline job is like completed in the time it takes to like cross single morsel. Like, what does that mean? The same pipeline, so it says what? There was like a line called a photo finish. They're guaranteed to reach the finish line within the time period it takes to process a single morsel. All threads working on the same pipeline job. But like, does that mean like all of these would finish at the exact same time? I, I think what they mean by that is like they're not the because everything's in memory. The amount of time, like say here for this one, when they were all A's, because everything's in memory, they're going to be close enough. Okay. It's not like this thing's going to be waiting on disk and therefore be minutes slower, right? It's just like the idea is again because they only execute one query at a time. Rather than have this guy be idle, waiting for B2 to finish, then A3 has to finish, and then has to execute B3 before you can execute the next task, it can go ahead and just go ahead and steal it. Yes? So do you delete the morsel B3 from this tree? His question is, do, for this one here, when I had to copy the morsel uh, into my CPU cache running the socket here, do I then, uh, do I then physically, you know, permanently move it to be over here? No. Right, because again, the next query might show up, and now maybe this this socket is is the slow one, right? And now this guy might be stealing back from me, right? Typically, you don't move the memory around once it's already uh, once it's already uh, placed in locations. You may want to repart repartition it, uh, maybe you know split it up on a different attribute, but that's even rare in, in many in most systems as well. Okay. So again, because they only have one worker per core, Hyper has to use that work stealing because otherwise they're going to be, they have threads waiting for, for stragglers. And as we already said, they use a lock-free hash table to maintain global work queues. So that means that the overhead of going and grabbing things from the work queue is not that significant relevant, relative to the actual cost of processing the morsel. So now I want to talk about another approach from Hanna. Um, and it sort of gets into what he was saying. Uh, about how you want to organize the queue. So Hana is going to be using a, uh, actually be very clear, this is from a research paper uh, that a PhD student wrote while employed at SAP. So in, 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 in Germany, they have a model for PhDs where a, a student can go work full time at the company. They still do research. They still write papers. They get paid by that company, like a regular salary, like a, like a, you know, not like a PhD stipend. Um, but then they get, they get the degree from an institution. So, as far as I know, what I'm describing here never actually made it into the real HANA system, although the student was actually you know, physically working on the real HANA source code when they implemented this. But this is sort of a, a, you know, a different approach to how to do scheduling that than what HANA actually really does. You're saying it didn't work well, so, so his statement is, does that mean whatever they described here did not work out and therefore they did not want to put it into the real HANA system? There's like, yes, this is a good idea. We should do that. And then there's like the engineering overhead of taking this research code and putting it to the real system. That's oftentimes why this stuff doesn't materialize, right? But I mean, it's not, not like it's wasted work, right? Certainly, like, if now ACP decides to build a new system, which they actually end up rewriting a lot of HANA, you know, they now know something about, uh, you know, some of the way, different alternatives ways to organize the, the scheduling mechanisms so they could have done this. So I actually don't know. Since the 2019 rewrite of HANA that came out last year, I don't know whether they do this. I suspect not. But I, I, I just don't know. All right, so what they're going to do is they're going to, it's a pool-based uh, queue, but they're going to have multiple workers 
per socket. So it's not going to be the same thing in HANA where you have one worker per core. Every core can have multiple workers, and they're going to be in different different. Um, they're going to have you know, different statuses. Uh, and so each group now also is going to have a, a soft and a hard priority queue. So this is, this is what he was saying. So couldn't I have a queue where I know that's local to me and I go check that first? And if nothing's there, then I go check another queue that's the global one. That's this. So the soft queue would be local to my group. Uh, it's going to be some number of workers running on the same socket. Uh, sorry, take it back. That's, that's the hard queue. The hard queue is local to my group. And hard means that nobody can steal from me. Uh, and the soft one means that someone is allowed to go ahead and steal this. So I still want to execute both tasks. This just says that this thing has to run in my socket or run in my group. No one can take it. And these are things that are eligible to be stolen from, from other, other things. So now they're going to have, have a separate watchdog thread that's going to have a global view of what's going on at every single group on every single socket. And then they can decide that whether some group is being oversubscribed and has more tasks that they can actually process. And then it can take threads away from one group and then allocate additional threads or allow additional threads to run in another group. So, so it's sort of, you're getting uh, both types of balancing. You're having the work stealing that you have under Hyper, but you also have the ability to, to crank up the number of threads you want to be executing tasks uh, as well. So you sort of get the, uh, you get, you're using two, both approaches. So as I said, we have a soft queue and, and a hard queue. So threads are allowed to steal tasks from other soft queues, uh, and the hard queues, you're, you're not allowed to do that. And then for the different pools, uh, for within a group, we're going to have four different pools that keep track of what types of threads we have running. So a working thread is when we have one that's actively running a task that it pulled from some queue. It doesn't matter what queue it came from. It just We know that it's processing something. We have an inactive thread where we, we know we're blocked in the kernel due to some latch. Uh, and at some later point, it, it'll get woken up. A free th thread is one where it's going to sleep a little wake up, check its queue to see whether there's anything for it to execute in the soft or the, or, the, or the hard queue local to it. If, if so, then it go ahead and execute it and now becomes a working thread. If not, then it goes back to sleep. And then we have part threads where the thread just sleeps and it doesn't get woken up until the watchdog thread comes, comes along and says, hey, we, we need you, you know, wake up and actually start doing stuff. And so again, what this is going to allow us to do is we can now scale up the number of threads we, we have uh, like in the park thread queue case, because like or the pool case, because if I recognize that my group cannot, all my threads are working or they're inactive. There's no free threads because they're all they're all working on things. If I don't have enough resources to process the work I need to have for my, my group, I can now release these park threads or unpark them and have them start processing things as well. And then maybe on another uh, group, I'll park their threads. So this is a lot of work, right? This is this sounds like an operating system, and because it sort of is. And we'll see this from, from, from SQL Server in a few more slides, where they actually did build an operating system that runs inside the database system. And they even call it that. Uh, so with this, they're gonna, again, they're going to they're gonna adjust the threads, from, uh, the pinning of the threads, where they're actually running, based on uh, whether the task is CPU bound or memory bound. So like, if my task is, uh, if for my, for my group, if my task says that I, you know, I, I have a bunch of tasks and I can't process them fast enough, I could allow threads to, to, to well, I, I could park them if I have too, not enough work, if I, I can unpark them if I have, too, have more work than they actually need, and I have to do that for other socket because I don't want to saturate the memory bandwidth uh, over, the, over the all system because the, maybe those tasks are pulling data over the interconnect, right? What was interesting about this is that they found that when they looked at the really large socket machines that HANA can run on, they found that the hyper approach of allowing the work stealing was actually a bad idea. So in the hyper paper, they were looking, I think, at two to four socket machines. The HANA guys are looking at like 64 socket or 128 socket machines. So in that environment, what you want to do is you don't have any soft queues. You put everything in the hard queue, and you can then scale up the number of threads you, you're running on every, single, uh, on every single group, on every single socket, but you don't allow threads to to take work from another socket and go over the interconnect. Everybody always processes things, things locally, right? Yes? So what's the difference between the task in the soft queue and the hard queue? The task in the soft queue and the hard queue? Like, what would be an example? Like, what would be, like, differences between, like, how do you decide to play, like, put a task in the soft queue or a hard queue? So, like, so the question is, what, what, how do I know what to put in a hard queue versus a soft queue? 
So like a hard queue might be, um, a task would be like, well, we'll see in the next slide. So in HANA for this example, they have oh, the entire system architecture is running on these, these worker pools. So that means like network requests will be running on the worker pool. So if I have a, um, if I have a task that says, you know, read the next message, next packet from the socket, I want to run that, you know, at, at the, at the thread or at the socket, where, where, or at the, the CPU socket on the network where that network socket is located. And I don't want somebody else to go, go take that from me. Yeah, so I mean, this, this is the next slide. So again, like their thread groups are running everything. So in the hyper case, the, 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 the pools were only doing processing queries. They're putting everything in the system. So now you can do things like if my, if I have, I'm oversubscribed on the number of uh, queries I'm executing, rather than accepting new network requests, I'll take some networking threads from their pool and spin up new threads or uh, unpark threads in my, my execution pool. And so that sort of gets the, the natural flow control of, of not you know, taking more queries than you actually can execute. So here's that same query we had before, right? And so save these, these tasks here, we can put into the soft queue, and then for whatever reason, we put these other tasks in, in the hard queue, right? For my purpose here, it, does, it doesn't actually matter. I'm just showing this for illustration purposes. So now, again, all the worker queues, the worker, the worker threads are pulling from the soft queue. My inactive threads are just waiting on something in the OS. The free threads are just spinning on the soft queue or the hard queue looking for work to do, and the park threads are just are blocked by the watchdog thread. So again, say here that I recognize that I can't keep up uh, with my demands. So say now my free thread pulls out something from the hard queue, then it gets migrated now, and now it's considered to be a working thread. And the watchdog thread above the, all this knows how many threads are actually running on every single group, and it can make scheduling decisions about, about or resource allocation decisions up above. Yes? So what's the part of threading? Part threading are like threads in reserve. Okay. So like instead of calling spawn, I just have them there. Okay. Right? So they are, I actually don't know what the, the true difference, I think an active thread would be like, I'm blocked waiting to get like a latch or a mutex in the OS, but if I come back, then I, I become, become working. This is like, I think you're parked in the OS, uh, you're, you're blocked in the OS on some mutex. And it's like, you know, it's the conditional variable where like some other threat has to come and say, now you're allowed to wake up. And the idea is that I can dynamically have these guys get released and execute without having to call, call, call spawn, because that's a context switch, or a syscall and a context switch. Okay. So the last scheduling thing I want to talk about is, which I think is the most fascinating one out of all of these. It's not for an in-memory system, um, but again, it's, it's, so, it's so different than everything else we've talked about so far, but I think, I think it's amazing. Um, so in SQL Server in 2005, they released in the, the new version of SQL Server, they now released, uh, that in bundled inside the database system, this basically a user mode operating system called SQL OS. And the idea is that this is a layer that sits above the real operating system, like the Windows kernel, uh, and the actual the database system engine itself that manages and provisions hardware resources. And the original motivation of this was that rather than the, the you know, as, as, as Numa was coming more prevalent, as there was hardware changes, rather than having all the different implementations or of the different operators inside the, the database system execution engine, rather than them have to all be aware of, of NUMA and, and memory, lo memory layouts and things like that, they would have abstract all that away through the SQL OS layer and have it make decisions about uh, you know, where to actually run tasks and how to actually you know, run things in parallel. So it's, it, the thing's amazing because it's, it's more than just like scheduling threads. They do a bunch of other stuff, like I.O. scheduling. Uh, they actually manage the buffer pool inside the SQL OS. They, they, they do lock scheduling and, and, and lock management inside this as well. And again, the idea here is that rather than us having to, to have these ad hoc implementations of, of, of specialized logic to deal with, like, oh, this thread's waiting for this lock, and therefore my, my join algorithm can run this way or whatever, like, all that is taken care of in the SQL OS layer. And you just implement your basic operators up above, and this thing handles all that for you. Right? Again, when you think of like, if you took the, the intro class, we talked about disk-oriented database systems, right? We talked about the buffer pool manager. The buffer pool manager is basically replicating the same logic that the OS does for virtual memory. Allocate some pages, or I, 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 I can allocate more memory than I'm actually available to me, and I, I know how to swap things down on disk. So, so Microsoft basically went all in and said, let's do everything the OS is doing and put it inside of our database system. 
right? It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. So, but for this lecture, what we're going to talk about is they are doing, uh, for thread scheduling, they're going to do non-preemptive thread scheduling uh, by modifying the, the database system code itself to be able to yield back to, some, to, to the scheduler. So before we get to that, i also say too, is like this SQL OS layer is part of the reason why Microsoft was able to port SQL Server over to, to Linux. So there was an announcement, uh, it was in 2017, and th th this TechCrunch article, they talk about how when they had to take SQL OS, and instead of talking to Win32, they now talk to the Linux kernel, that wasn't a major change for them. I mean, it was not, it was not insignificant, but it's not like they need to change all other aspects of the database system, because all of this low-level uh, management of, of OS of resources and hardware resources is all done by this OS layer. So you just change the SQL OS part to make it stalk to Linux and not touch anything else. So the same code base for doing all the join algorithms, doing all the execution uh, flow control, all concurrent control, all the indexes, all that sits above SQL OS, and they didn't have to modify any of that. Going back to my example of DB2 before, DB2 did not have that abstraction layer, so that's why they have four different distinct code bases. Right? They've attempted, I think, to try to have a unified code base, but it never, you know, it's, it never happened. It's never going to happen. Microsoft was able to do it through the SQL OS. So I think it's really fascinating. Okay, so what does preemptive uh, thread scheduling look like in their world? So in SQL OS, the quantum is going to be, for every thread, it's going to be four milliseconds. Anybody know what the, the, the quantum size is in default Linux? His question is, what's the quantum? Uh, quantum is like, um, so, so, you have, so you have a thread. It gets scheduled on, the, the OS schedules it for execution. It's going to run for a certain amount of time called the quantum. And then at some point when the quantum's up, there's an interrupt. They take your thread away and, hand it, and have a context switch to another thread. Right? Time slice would be another term, right? So for, for those of you who've taken OS or OS class, what is, what is, the, what is the quantum size in Linux? Nobody knows because it's a vague answer because it's actually dynamic, right? It can, it can vary, I, uh, you know, depending on the clock speed, depending on what else is running, right? If it knows that there's no other threads running that are, you know, taking demand from the, from the CPU, it can then make your quantum slightly larger, right, to avoid a context switch to some other task that, that's not needed, right? If you switch into real-time mode for Linux, then the quantum is fixed to be, I think, 100 milliseconds. Like the idea there is like again the context switches are not cheap because you're taking all the registers, putting out you know in, into into to CPU caches, changing the uh, the program counter, like all that's not cheap, and so in the real time OS they let your quantum long for a longer time. So in in Siegel OS the quantum time is going to be four milliseconds, but they have no way to enforce this because this is all done in user level or in user mode, meaning we hand a task off to a, a thread, it runs. There's no way for us because in in we're running in the same process and we're not the OS, there's no way for us to say, Thread, you're done. Give us, give us back control of, of, the, of the core. And you can't do that because that, that's what the OS does because they can do it through hardware. So what they're going to do now is modify, they went and modified the, the source code of SQL Server itself to introduce yield calls to cause the thread to go back and, and you know, return control back to the scheduler. So let's say this is a simple query here, select star from A, where A dot val equals some parameter. So a really simple implementation of this would be a for loop where we get a bunch of tuples, evaluate a predicate, and then if they match our predicate, we emit it. So what basically what Microsoft had to do was go back and modify the source code to keep track of the amount of time that they spent uh, at these different parts and recognize that if the, if the time since the last, the last time I called yield to the scheduler was was you know, more than you know, four milliseconds ago, then I go ahead and yield. That puts control back now to the scheduler. The scheduler can decide whether to run your task again or whether to hand it off to another task. And so this is amazing. This, this is like pseudocode. They're obviously not calling you know, get current timestamp over and over again for every single tuple. That would be stupid. I, I think the way they did it was they sort of knew like in the code itself, like if I'm doing a for loop, uh, you know, they know the cost of going and maybe retrieving a tuple, and whether it's in disk or it's in memory, the, what the time of that is, and they can then use some built-in calculations to decide very cheaply, have I, has my four, four milliseconds uh, gone up? Yes? How does it control the next trip that the OS is going to schedule? Like, that is also very important in the entire thing, right? So his question is, how do I control what the next thread the OS is going to schedule? 
right? I can't do like you can't. Read, 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 read until that thread is the one that is running, right? OS yield or SQL OS or yield? This is yield. Like, so this this is this is not an operating system yield. This is a like SQL OS yeah. yield. But like even on there, uh, like they can't. Uh, okay, you're saying that uh, they can control which SQL server thread is running. They can control what SQL Server task is running. Right. Yes, right. And so there's a bunch of advantages of this. So one is you're right. I like I can't prevent the OS from swapping out the scheduler, right? So what the you know, best practices for setting up any database system is run the data system on a machine by itself. And so you do, you know you're not doing Bitcoin mining or, or or you know encoding a video or watching YouTube at the same time you're trying to run transactions, right? So the, the, the contention for the CPU will be lower, and with cooperative scheduling or the, 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 the fair scheduling approach in, in Linux, if I know another thread is trying to access, you know, trying to do stuff, I'll come back to my, the thread right away. So yes, I could be in the middle of this, the OS might swap me out. Correct, so, so, this, so this, this quantum time is a, is a user mode concept. Only we are running that spend. What's that? Like only SQL Server is running on the Correct. The data system. Yeah, yes. Um, another interesting advantage you get from this as well is like now I can do sort of fair scheduling and provisioning for uh, between maybe different tenants of, of the same. I'm running on the same database, so I have two customers running my same SQL Server instance. One is I could just divide them up to run on different sockets, but I could also now just use these quantums to enforce that they go, both get equal time, or like. If I now have a budget for how many quantums I'm going to give for one tenant versus another, the quantum time still going to be four milliseconds, but maybe I give more quantums to this other guy because they, they're giving me more money than, than, the, than the first tenant. So this allows you to do all sorts of, all sorts of amazing things that you can't easily do uh, with the hyper approach or the, uh, or the Han approach because they, they don't know what the, what the actual tasks are actually trying to do. All right? So I. Don't know whether, as far as I know, nobody else does this uh, with like, this SQL OS layer. This is something I want to do in our system because I think it'll benefit the self-driving stuff. Um, the only other system that I know that does something similar is FaunaDB. And so they're not doing the same kind of like fixed quantum size. or not, Again, it's not fixed, but they try to make it be always four milliseconds. But, but the way HANA does this is that they only yield back to the in-database scheduler whenever you do I.O. So in, in SQL OS, I could do all this in memory, and I'm still going to yield back after my quantum is, is, is roughly up. In Fauna DB, they basically say, oh, I'm going to read something from disk or, or over the network. Let me go back to my scheduler and say, hey, I'm going to pause for a bit. Schedule somebody else if, if, if you can. And if the, if the scheduler says, oh, you're fine, go, and then, then you, you get back control. Otherwise, it schedules something else. Yes? Is this a good project three? Yes. We can talk about this. Yes. Um, and right now, we don't really have anything. I don't have slides for this. We use, for query execution, we use Intel's thread building blocks, which I don't like because it's basically, it's almost like a black box. You basically, you basically for the query plan, you divide it up into a DAG, you hand it off to the uh, to thread, uh, to TB, TB, TBB library in the, its scheduler. It does its thing, and eventually you get it back a response. But you can't send in something else at the same time. At least I don't think. Okay. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is how to do flow control. I sort of briefly talked about this about with, with the hard and soft queues approach. Like, if I recognize that uh, I can't process queries fast enough, then I can take away networking threads and assign, you know, unpark uh, query processing threads. But basically, like, if queries are showing up faster than we can handle them, then we're going to become overloaded. So once again, the OS is not going to help us because if we're CPU bound, then it just does nothing, right? If we're memory bound, and actually what his question is, like, if I allocate one terabyte of memory and I don't have one terabyte of memory and I don't have one terabyte of swap space, what's going to happen? Well, the OS call, has this special thing called the out of, out of memory killer, OOM. And basically it says, oh, I'm running out of memory. I'm running out of swap space. Let me pick a random process and just kill it, right? And you get a SIG term. It, you, you, you know, it just kills you, right? Uh, yes? Say if, if you did something like calic, would that make a difference? Uh, so, something like what, sorry? Like calic, like you actually like write something to the space initially? What is calic, sorry? As, as in like it, it zero initializes everything. So, so you're actually like... It, oh. With the OS, could the OS still... Like, oh, calic, sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
what, 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 so what would that do? If, like, if, if I try to malloc and initialize one terabyte of memory, oh, yeah. it's going to start running out the swap space. And again, like, if, if I don't have enough swap space, it, it, I think the policy is for OOM, I think it picks whatever the one that has the most memory. Because again, from the operating system world, like, Linux's job is not to die, right? And if, and if, so in order for it to survive, it's got to kill your database system. It's going to do it, right? Um, so, you know, and, and so for, from the operating system perspective, this is the right thing to do. Instead of me crack grinding to a halt and never doing anything, right, I'll, I'll kill the data system and then that way you can still, you know, watch YouTube. Okay? So from a, again, from the data system, that's the same thing. We can just crash. But we can do something a little bit smarter. And there's basically two concepts here. Uh, Emission control and throttling. And basically the idea is where do we recognize where our bottleneck is that we can't process things fast enough? And then how do we then expose that out to the, uh, to, to the outside world so that new queries don't show up and we get overwhelmed? So emission control is basically we recognize that uh, a, a query shows up and then we don't have enough resources to execute it right now because we, we, we're CPU bound or we're running out of memory. We go ahead and just say we, we reject the request. Um, and I think in the Postgres protocol, I, I don't think you can send back a specific uh, rejection request, but you can send back a like, query failed or it's closed connection. Throttling would be you just uh, introduce some artificial delay for queries as they show up so that the idea is that if I, I sleep a little before I maybe start processing the query, whereas I'm running the query, maybe sleep a little as well. And that way, the for the system overall, because now queries are not trying to all do, the, do, you know, do work at the same time, th this will sort of smooth things out and I can, I, can, you know, I can actually process things and make forward progress. So I'm not saying one is better than another. Different systems do different things. This one is probably the most common one, but again, this needs, you need to now be aware of what's going on in the, in the, in the, in the actual worker pools where you actually execute queries in order to make this decision. For this one, you don't need any centralized control. You just say, you know, well, other than like, I need to recognize that I'm, I, I'm going slower or my queue is getting a, lo a certain size that, or I can't, it's getting larger than it is uh, smaller as I process things. Then I just introduce these things, but I don't need to make a global decision. Every thread can make its own decision about, about introducing the sleep. Okay? So the high-end systems can do this. This is sort of like a, a Approach one, approach two, sorry, it's backwards. But like, th this is the easiest one to do. The high-end systems can do this. Because you can do other things like, I can have, uh, I can have priority queues to say, like, if uh, someone connects with this username, let their queries always run, even though I'm oversaturated. Whereas like, if someone else is like a low-paying low customer, they can run slower. And certainly if I'm the admin, uh, the, like, a lot of these systems always maintain one open port for, for the admin to be able to connect to the system and execute queries to start killing things and, 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 and you know, uh, free of resources. So in that case here, that's, you know, th this is very common. All right, so we covered a lot today. Uh, the main takeaway, again, throughout the entire semester, and especially today, is that what is a database system? Well, it's a beautiful piece of software that we don't want the OS to ruin for us. So we're going to try to do as much as, as we can as possible. SQL OS is sort of one extreme, but at the very least, we need to be aware of the layout of memory, where threads are going to be running, so that we, we minimize that that traffic over the interconnect, right? And the, 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 the amount of metadata we need to maintain about where a morsel is located or where a block of data is located is pretty low, right? It's not like we need to know anything inside the system. We need to know if you want this address, here's where it's located. Or we could also do the syscall on the fly and say, well, I know there's a block located here. What NUMA region is it located in? And then assign a task to it after that. But typically, that's, that, you don't want to do that because that's a syscall. Uh, and so we, we want to track everything our, ourselves. And the OS, again, it's a frenemy. We need it to live, but we don't want to actually have to talk to it as much as possible. We don't want it to do anything. OK? Any questions? All right, so next class, now we're going into more detail about what these tasks actually look like and how we're actually going to execute them. OK? And then we'll post on Piazza for the update of the, the checkpoint for, for Project 2. And if you don't have a group, I will email you today and force you to, to make friends and pick a group. Okay? All right, guys. See ya. Bank it in the side pocket. What is this? Some old bullshit. Hey, yo, hey, yo. What? Took a sip and had to spit because I ain't with that beer called the OE because I'm OG. Ice Cube down with the STI. You looked and it was gone.
my buzz on Cause I needed just a little more kick Hooked like a fish after just one sip Put it to my lips and rip the top off A ball done dropped up The same eyes hopped off And my hood won't be the same After Ice Cube take a same eye to the brain yeah.